So today we are going to see on uh, renal failure and a clinical approach. Though a very la large uh, subject, but still I would like to make it uh, as much as possible. So I'm not uh, dealing um, all renal diseases. I'm just going to deal with acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. By and large, uh, we see a lot of them in our practice. And um, to what extent uh, we all have success depends on uh, you know the clinical acumen we all possess and uh, it requires a uh, you know certain uh, set of skills uh, to master this uh, problem which is a very very common problem for example in uh, dogs the uh, 1.6% incidence of uh, chronic renal disease and in cats much more the cats have become now after the you know um, covid they become a more uh, precious pet than dogs so there it is even much more than uh, dogs. So definitely um, uh, disease which requires our complete uh, you know, uh, concentration. That is the reason why we started this. So we will uh, deal with uh, acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. So first we'll see what are the consequences of renal failure. So you know the kidneys are the one which is a major excretory organ in the body. And since it is becoming uh, uh, diseased, you have a problem of retention of nitrogenous waste materials like blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, and so forth. And kidneys again uh, one which uh, completely um, uh, uh, does the fluid and electrolyte ba balance in the body. So whenever it is diseased, you have a derangement of fluid and electrolytes and uh, derangement of acid-base balance because of a bicarbonate uh, problem. And um, because of, um, you know, uh, renin angiotensin uh, activate, being activated, there is constriction of renal vessels leading on to hypertension. Once there is hypertension, there's going to be a lot of problem like uh, uh, hypertensive retinopathy, hypertensive uh, glomeropathy, and, you know, uh, myopathies, and uh, renal, I mean, uh, central nervous system diseases, all going to ensue in uh, as a consequence of renal failure. And of course, secondary hyperparathyroidism because of hyperphosphatemia and the um, play of uh, PTH, parathyroid hormone, you have secondary hyperparathyroidism, in, especially in young dogs, where there's going to be absorption of calcium and you're going to have a, a condition called rubbery jaw. So when we get a case of, um, suspected case of renal problem, First thing is to see if it's got basically is it a renal disease in the case the uh, case presented. There can be so many other uh, uh, diseases which can mimic a renal disease. Uh, for example, uh, you know a pyometra or a sepsis or a hypovolemic disease or cardiovascular disease. All this thing can have a, a consequent. Oh yeah, but can I not? Renal disease. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but is, is a disease glomerular, tubular. Or <laughs> This is most important. Take appropriate therapy. So, a, a, a acute kidney injury and a, a chronic kidney injury has got a broader spe a spectrum of uh, treatment, but still specific treatment requires that we uh, see if there is a glomerular, tubular, or interstitial. And is the disease acute or chronic? So that is again very important. Acute renal failure is mostly reversible. Chronic renal failure is irreversible, and therefore. The prognosis for the two different diseases are entirely different. So we need to know whether it is an acute disease or a chronic. There are a lot of set rules to find out whether it is acute or chronic. However, they may be mixed. Sometimes you can have a chronic a decompensated patient being presented as an acute case. It is all acute on chronic. So it's very important that we know whether it's got an acute disease or a chronic disease. And is the disease reversible or reversible? This is again a very important, uh, you know, uh, criteria which we should know for starting treatment. Is the disease progressive or non-progressive? This is again, you might have a, uh, you know, a dog presented with a burn and creatinine, elevated burn and creatinine, a creatinine level of three, uh, stage three uh, disease, but it need not be progressive. Where the uh, prognosis is much guarded, you can have a safe, good life for some more years. So you should. Very important that we decide whether it's a progressive disease or a non-progressive disease, and what is the prognosis. This is again very important. We cannot give a false promise to the clients. We need to tell them the prognosis. So for all these purposes, this is very important. 
Now the history. History is again the most important as it, as it, you know all the diseases. The history is the most important thing. As here also uh, you know renal disease also history is very important. The case is presented to you. Is it presented to you with prolacturia? Prolacturia is frequent urine. This urea is it having a difficulty in urinate. Polyuria does it pass uh, excessive uh, urine or inappropriate urination? Uh, your client will say, my dog or cat is never urinated in the bed. There's no urinating in the blood, in the bed. So inappropriate urination, hematuria, bleed, bleeding in the uh, urine, again is very important. The initiation of urine, how the initiation of urine, whether it is, uh, you know, splashes or whether it is spraying, all this is very important. You know, you know, this case of uh, you know, stones. Spraying. Okay, the diameter of the stream of the urine again is very important. In a case of prostate involvement, the diameter will be varying. So the initiation of urine, the diameter of the stream, they are all very important history which you should collect from the client. If the client is not very clear about it. Ask them to observe and come back the next day with a clear, you know, history of how the initiation of urine or diameter of the stream, uh, you know, stream is there. Timing for hematuria. This is again very very important. We should ask repeated questions. Whether the dog is having hematuria, the start of urination, in which case it is, uh, you know, uh, stone. Whether it is having at the end of urination, it's a case of cystitis. Whether uh, the blood is mixed with urine or not. If it is mixed with the urine, then it is a problem of a tumor or a uh, coagulation abnormalities. So the timing of hematuria, the urination is very, very important. Polydipsia. Polydipsia, again, whether it is having an increased thirst, Combined with polyuria or only polydipsia, sometimes you may have a physiological polydipsia. So we need to know whether it's got polydipsia or polyuria or uh, polydipsia alone. All this history you should be able to collect from the client. Then exposure to toxins. So, for example, uh, you know, cats are you know highly toxic to lilies, and dogs are highly uh, toxic to raisins. Dogs they are toxic to chocolates. So you might have antifreeze, not in our country, majority in cold countries you have antifreeze. So exposure to toxins, again, are very important. And drugs, whether the, the client has treated them with a non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, or they, whether they treated them with uh, uh, gentamicin, uh, nephrotoxic drugs. So the, uh, the, the medication is, uh, history of medication is very, very important in, first of all, thinking it could be a renal disease. The chronology of events. When it started, when, it, when was the last, you should ask the question, when was your dog last normal? You will say, almost about three, four months, it has not been doing well. He's not eating, he's vomiting, no one then, all this. So, so you have a history of a three month duration. It's almost a chronic disease. You say, till last week, it was fine. Since two, three days only, it's showing vomiting. Then it's probably uh, acute uh, kidney injury. So the chronology of event is very important while you ask history. And physical examination, so not to undermine physical examination, which many vets do not do it properly. And especially vets who visit a house, they, their chances for doing a thorough physical examination is highly minimized. So I generally discourage uh, vets going to their houses for uh, doing uh, services. It's better always the pet is brought to the clinic uh, so that you can have a very good physical examination. So hydration status, whether it's hydrated, the presence of edema or ascites. So that again is got a lot. So you have to examine the dog for edema and ascites. Then examination of oral cavity, uremic ulcers, necrosis of the tip of the tongue, mucous membrane color. All these things uh, will uh, definitely make you uh, go near the diagnosis of a renal disease. Then fundic examination. In all my uh, you know um, lectures, I somehow try and go into this fundic examination because it throws a lot of light on um, many of the systemic diseases. La, la, about uh, 10, 15 days back, we were, we were in Lucknow. We made it a point to show everyone how to use an ophthalmoscope. Fundic examination, you can use, you can see clearly see uh, hypertensive retinopathy and you can see bleeding. All those things you'll be able to examine. You directly have a diagnosis. Deformity of the maxilla and mandible, rubber jaw. Palpation of kidney and bladder, if possible, you can, you know, uh, renomegaly or, um, uh, uh, yeah, you know, sort of um, a bladder which is full with, uh, filled with uh, 
uh, stones or uh, with uh, mass. All this thing can be palpated for pain, palpation of kidney for pain, pyelonephritis, it can have pain. Then palpation of prostate, so that is again very important to find out uh, extra renal uh, problems. Then examination of vagina, maybe you have uh, you know, uh, purulent discharge, which can go in for pyelonephritis. Straight away, a diagnosis you get by doing uh, examination of the vagina. So physical examination is a must to go into any diagnosis. So these are all some of the uh, clinical signs attributable to uh, you know uh, renal disease, uh, severe gastroenteritis with uh, you know hemorrhagic gastroenteritis or melina. These are all signs of gastri uh, you know um, uremic gastritis. So similarly, you can see ulcers, oral cavity ulcers, plaque, severe plaque. Again, it's a, a predisposure to um, uh, renal disease, both in cats and dogs. And you can see the necrosis of the tip of the tongue. There are like acute signs of uremic crisis. So here you can see, um, you know, ophthalmoscope, uh, which is being used, where you can see a retinal hemorrhage. And you can see a uh, tortuous uh, retinal vessels from the optic disc. So yeah, straight away you get a diagnosis of uh, hypertensive retinopathy because of renal hypertension. renal failure. First, we'll see acute renal failure. So, sudden decrease in renal function that results from an acute insert in the nephrons leading to accumulation of nitrogenous waste products characterized by lethargy, inappetence, vomiting, anuria, and acetemia on biochemical evaluation. See, this acetemia need not be always present, but you know, you always find in, uh, lethargy, inappetence, vomiting, and anuria, uh, you know, uh, to start with. So what are the causes of uh, acute renal failure? Ischemia. Any disease which can cause ischemia, that is uh, lack of oxygen to the tissues, to the nephrons, can cause acute renal failure. Any uh, shock, hypovolemic shock, or cardiogenic shock, or you know any um, uh, where there's a decompensation and there's a renal shutdown, there will be a lack of oxygen to the uh, renal tissues, and they will go in for acute renal Infection, leptospirosis is very characteristic in dogs for acute renal failure. And toxoplasma in cats, again, can cause acute renal failure in cats. Toxins, as I told you, uh, raisins, uh, chocolates, um, lilies, all this yeah. can cause acute renal failures. Infarction, again, I want you to clearly listen to this point, infarction. You might be treating a case of uh, Babesia, or you might be treating a case of uh, ekanis, or you might be treating a case of, uh, you know, uh, pyometra. And suddenly you have, a, you know, um, uh, polyuria, I mean, anuria, and you find that you, the animal was going in for acute renal failure. This is because of thromboembolism. It's called infarction. So in any of those cases where you think there can be a leaky blood vessel, where there can be, you know, platelet, platelet plugs being removed, in all those diseases, systemic inflammatory diseases, you can suspect uh, acute renal failure. So, uh, in fact, drugs, all uh, neurotox I mean, uh, nephrotoxic drugs like gentamicin, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, they can cause severe acute renal failure. There might be, a, uh, you know, some incidences where somebody has used melaxicam for a protracted time and, you know, the dog comes to you with uh, acute signs of vomition, lethargy, and you know you might uh, diagnose acute renal failure. Hypercalcemia can be due to tumors, or it can be due to rodenticide poisoning. And have hypercalcemia. Sepsis. Any infectious disease can go in for sepsis. So uh, you know the, the, in sepsis, it's also a systemic inflammatory response syndrome disease where all the blood vessels are leaky, and there therefore there can be ischemic disease of the uh, renal system. There can be shutdown, renal shutdown. And the animal can go in for acute.
So once you find there's a renal problem, acute renal problem, you will have to find, you know, categorize them as pre-renal or, you know, renal or post-renal. So you have different uh, small, small tests. Burn value in uh, pre-renal, uh, in all the uh, pre-renal, intra-renal and post-renal is increased. Creatinine is again increased in all the categories. Urine output is decreased in pre-renal. Intra-renal varies, often decreased. And post-renal varies, maybe decreased or sudden anuria can be there in post-renal. Then urine sodium decreased to less than 20 milli equivalents. And in intra-renal, it is more than 40 milli equivalents. And in case of post-renal, it varies. Urinary sediment, normal, few iron casts. And in uh, intra-renal, get abnormal casts and debris. It's very important that you do a urine examination and you find uh, sediments. Then you know it is intra-renal or uh, pre-renal. And uh, post-renal, you do not have any cast or any debris. And urine osmolality is, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, intra-renal uh, osmolality is similar to the serum, whereas in pre-renal, it is increased. So urine specific gravity in pre-renal, it is increased. And uh, intra-renal, it is low to normal. And post-renal varies. So uh, approximately, you can pinpoint where the problem is, acute renal failure pre-renal problem or intra-renal problem or post-renal problem. And next important, um, this one, um, uh, differentiation you should make it, acute renal failure versus chronic renal failure. In acute, the uh, number of days animal is sick is very short, days to weeks. In chronic, it is months to years. Minimum three months of unwellness is, uh, it's, you know, is taken as chronic problem. Hemoglobin concentrate is usually acute. There's no problem. Uh, you know, uh, chronic, there is anemia. Renal size, acute, there's no... Usually, it is normal or sometimes the renomegaly is there. Chronic, there's a small size kidney. Renal osteodystrophy is absent in acute diseases. In chronic diseases, especially young animals, is always present. Peripheral neuropathy is absent in acute and present in chronic renal disease. And serum creatine concentrate. Acute, you have reversible, but it's increased. In chronic, it is increased, but not reversible. So you do a series of, uh, you know, uh, creatinine. If you find uh, creatinine not coming down, then you think it is chronic and non-progressive. If it is increasing, then it is chronic and progressive. If it is reversal, then it is acute. And uh, what are the normal evaluation uh, which we look on to do acute renal failure, hematology? which we find, uh, you know, uh, leukocytosis, biochemistry, bun, creatinine, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, all these things will evaluate and tell you you got acid-based status, you got metabolic alkalosis, and urine analysis and culture. Urine analysis and culture is very, very important. Most of us, we tend to send a blood sample for biochemistry rather than sending urine analysis for culture. Urine analysis is going to tell us a lot about uh, the disease process, the specific gravity, uh, you know, uh, urine protein, creatinine basis, all this is, uh, you know, the presence of uh, cast, all these things are going to tell you about, uh, more about the renal uh, function. Culture, whether it is, uh, you know, really pyelonephritis or it has got any other problem. Calcium, again, we'll have to evaluate uh, hypercalcemia as a serious problem in renal, pro uh, renal disease. So, uh, augmentation test for, uh, you know, um, Leptospirosis, all the, you know, mycoplasma, all those things are very important. Uh, toxoplasma is very important in uh, microbial uh, diagnosis. So uh, if you find uh, laboratory findings in acute renal failure, uh, burn creatinine ratios, uh, you know, in pre-renal acetemia is greater than 20 is to 1. Oliguric uh, acute renal failure is 10 to 15. And urine uh, sodium, uh, less than 20 milli equivalents in case of pre-renal acetemia, greater than uh, 40 in oliguric acute renal failure. Urine osmolality is greater than 500 uh, milli uh, moles per liter and is less than 350 in oliguric renal failure. Fractional excretion of sodium is less than 1%, greater than 2% in oliguric renal failure. Urine creatinine and plasma creatinine ratio greater than 40 in pre-renal acetemia and all of your renal failure is then 20. These are all some of the classical laboratory findings in acute renal failure. 
and next special examination. So this is again I want to emphasize blood pressure is the most important um, uh, you know uh, value which you will uh, get in managing uh, renal failure and it is very important for staging them it is very uh, important for uh, 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 telling the prognosis and it is, uh, is very important for seeing the response to treatment blood pressure is very 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 aging no doubt about it urolets then you can uh, you know the size of the kidney uh, cyst, all those things, uh, you know, you can uh, directly diagnose with imaging and ultrasound. Special examination again is very important in uh, diagnosing acute renal failure. So when you come to treatment aspect of acute renal failure, the specific uh, therapy, the therapy is whenever you get a, a you know, um, uh, history of uh, consuming toxins, immediately within four to five hours or six hours, you try and induce emesis so that the uh, toxins will not get absorbed. And in case the time lapse is much more, the uh, toxins are absorbed, there's no big point in uh, giving emetics. You can give uh, gastric protectants, uh, then you can give uh, activated charcoal for absorption of leftover toxins. Right. Papa. Specific antidote whenever you think there is a, uh, the poison Papa. consumed, if you know, you can give antidote. Those antimicrobials like, in <laughs> Pyrosis uh, and you know um, toxoplasmosis, you give um, antimicrobials. And supported therapy, fluid therapy is very, very important because there's going to be uh, a rehydration problem. So, number one uh, fluid of choice is Ringer's lactate. And of course, again, it's very, very important. Fluid therapy should be done very, very judiciously because there is going to be anuria in case of acute renal failure. If inadvertently you keep on giving them more amount of uh, crystalloids, they'll all find their way into the interstitial space. Once they go into the interstitial space, oxygen exchange, uh, diffusion into the cells become a problem. Otherwise, it, uh, already there's a, the dog is very sick, the cells start dying, and you will have a severe uh, you know, um, tissue death, and eventually there can be organ failure. So, Inadvertently, you cannot give over uh, fluid therapy. You have to give uh, minimal. Usually, in a normal animal, normal uh, fluid therapy is around 90 ml. In case of renal failure, acute renal failure, you can give up to 60 ml per kg body weight in one day, and that too slowly. And uh, you can give uh, Ringer's lactate is very safe. And you can also go in for 0.9% sodium chloride whenever there is hyperkalemia. You suspect hyperkalemia or when you find hyperkalemia in you know, uh, laboratory evaluation, or you get um, hyperkalemia, uh, all T, T wave in VCG, then you can always go in for... Uh, Once you know that you know, the, uh, is hydrated, then you can reduce the fluid therapy to a very, very less extent. And next, once you know it is very uh, hydrated, and once you know there is anuria is uh, you know, uh, treated, then you can induce diuresis so that all the toxins will come out. So it is very important, the fluid therapy is tailor-made for each case according to analysis of your uh, uh, lights. Assess urine output. Again, you know, you know in any uh, uh, foreign, you know, in, in human uh, medicine, we always put a urinary catheter because it's very important to assess the urine output. So if you are able to catheterize and find out uh, what is the urine output, it will be an excellent uh, treatment modality. So assess hydration, then uh, you, you can uh, do it by uh, seeing the blood pressure monitorment and uh, CVP. Of course, uh, central vein uh, pressure is, unless you have a uh, central vein uh, put, you cannot do so CVP, but at least you can uh, assess the hydration by blood pressure monitoring. Also by clinically, how well is the uh, cornea moisture, elasticity. There can be some error in doing a physical examination and assessing hydration. The absence of uh, other uh, facilities as a hydration by clinical examination. If it is well hydrated, you can give crystalloids 2 to 5 ml per kg per hour. If there is a fluid overload, you think there's a fluid overload, excess moisture in the cornea or the, elastic, the elasticity is slipping, the, the skin is slipping uh, heavily on your finger when you're palpating, then there is a fluid overload. 
or when you find uh, pulmonary edema, then you know there's a fluid overload. Or if you find there is edema, interstitial edema, limb edemas, then you know there's a fluid overload and you can reduce the fluids. And you can give furosemide 2 mg per kg intravenously and increment doses if not responding or you can give a continuous uh, infusion. If anuria persists, you can go for mannitol 0.5 to 1 gram per kg body weight over 15 to 20 minutes or a CRI can give a uh, mannitol. And uh, alternatively, you can give 20% dextrose at the rate of 2 to 10 ml per kg body weight. And um, we, were, we were in the habit of giving um, before um, other drugs like, you know, for uh, management of uh, that. Uh, but nowadays, uh, uh, phenyldopon, which is thought to be very, very good, um, can use that. So you can uh, go in for uh, phenyldopon at the rate of uh, 0.5 microgram per kg per minute intravenously to induce uh, diuresis. And uh, the moment you are able to successfully um, uh, induce diuresis, the, the moment you have recovery from oliguria, then you have polyuria because all the fluids you have given so far will be accumulated and there'll be polyuria resulting in hyponatremia and hypokalemia. So you need to be very careful once there's a recovery from a poly, poly, so an anuria, the animal can go in for polyuria and then uh, henceforth you have to give um, uh, sodium and uh, potassium supplement in IV fluids. Again, to treat hyponatremia and hypokalemia, you have to be very careful. Hyponatremia need not uh, go for highly uh, strong uh, sodium. You give off saline because if you suddenly correct hyponatremia by giving uh, sodium rich uh, fluid, it can be severe uh, catastrophic events happening in the ESF fluid. So we can correct them by giving uh, off saline. Of course, hypokalemia can give potassium chloride uh, intravenously, can add to the IV fluid. And bicarbonate uh, deficit and hyperkalemia exists. There's going to be um, uh, metabolic uh, acidosis. Therefore, you can go in for uh, sodium bicarbonate. And uh, you can go, if you find hyperkalemia, you can give insulin and glucose, calcium gluconate, all these things to uh, treat hyperkalemia. Bicarbonate deficit, you can give uh, sodium bicarbonate. You can also go for uh, potassium citrate. The advantage of potassium citrate is, you know, it is, if it is hyperkalemic, it's good. But you have to be very careful. If it is hyperkalemic, you cannot give potassium citrate. So the treatment of complications of acute renal failure. There is going to be a severe gastritis, uremic gastritis. So we can go for drugs like pemetidine at the rate of 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg SID. Omeprazole, 0.7 milligram per kg SID. Uh, maropitin, the drug is not available here, it's centrally acting, antiemetic, it's an excellent drug, you can give uh, subcutaneously SID. Metoclopramide is again a wonderful drug, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 milligram per kg, TID intravenous. Condensetron, 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg, TID intravenously. And you can also go in for uh, things like uh, condensetron sprays and things like that, especially you get like uh, cats, you know, they are very, uh, they have severe nausea, they keep vomiting and things like that. They can go use ondensetron spray and later induce them to take food so that there will not be any vomiting. <laughs>
Phenazaprol is a better drug than enalapril. Both are AC inhibitors. Phenazaprol is being, you know, uh, metabolized in the hepatic system. Therefore, uh, phenazaprol is a better drug of choice uh, while treating hypertension. Again, uh, nutritional management uh, is again very important. Con what are the consequences of anorexia? So there is a severe immunosuppression, reduce, uh, reduced repair of organs which are diseased, and hepatic lipidosis. At least in cats, if the you know, cat is not going to eat for three to four days, then there will be a mobilization of fats from all the places, and it will be depositing the liver. And the cat will show in fourth day or fifth day, it will become uh, intric. Jaundice will be there. Hepatic lipidosis is a very serious problem. So uh, anorexia, we'll have to go for appetite stimulants. There are uh, several appetite stimulants available. You all know, Practum, uh, you know, Apticwake, uh, Buclizin, and then, you know, uh, such of those drugs are uh, excellent for uh, So especially catch is very important. And uh, enteral nutrition, if we, still you are not able to stimulate, the, stimulate their appetite, then you'll have to go for enteral nutrition is very, very important. That the uh, animal would definitely eat at the earliest time possible. Next, we'll go for a chronic renal failure. Chronic renal failure is a relatively common syndrome in older dogs. It's an end stage number of renal diseases. Clinical signs of CRF are not usually apparent until a person is suffering of renal tissue. Early cases often go undetected because till it uh, is decompensated, uh, we will never know that a renal problem. That is the biggest problem with whether it is human or cat. Yes, they are when the, the, by the time they are presented to the veterinarian, they already has a chronic renal. And uh, most common in dogs and cats, and most often irreversible, and it is always progressive. And initial presenting sign is polyuria polydentia. Then they come to be a vet. Creatinine is practically a marker for staging them. Of course, yes, DMA also is good. Creatinine is a marker for staging, not diagnosing. Aging is done based on creatinine, protein species, uh, and measuring arterial blood pressure and creatinine and protein ratios and measuring all these things in it based on which you have to treat so what are the complications of uh, chronic kidney disease first is anemia because the hormone erythropoietin is formed in the renal system therefore you don't get uh, use rbc so when you get a report from the pathologist should get with the left to shift, left or shift to right. This is the they find in the picture uh, young RBCs, immature RBC. That means it's a uh, you know, using RBC, nothing to do with uh, it. find it is non regenerative anemia, then it is uh, arterial hypertension. Is good. We'll talk about hypertension later. Cut off value will be talked later. Fluid and electrolyte imbalance is the most important complication of CKD. Hyperparathyroidism in a young dog, in a big dog. Hyperphosphatemia, uh, we know that. Hyperparathyroidism. acidosis and uh, uremia, uremic crisis. Are all the complications of. So, what are the uh, laboratory evaluation we should have? Urine analysis, culture. So urine analysis, you get to know whether it is because of infection. Let's say you know what type of Okay, CBC, again, you get to find out uh, so many, um, you know, uh, ideas about what is ongoing uh, in a chronic kidney disease. And uh, urinary protein, urinary creatine ratio is, again, most important. We'll see how important it is to evaluate and stage uh, the disease. One and creatinine, as, uh, as usual, uh, they are the um, ideal markers uh, for kidney um, uh, disease, especially CKDs. And uh, again, staging also is done by creatinine. And of course, you have you do have SDMA, but still, uh, for most of the practitioners who do not have uh, IDEX, 
you can go in for burn and free abdomen. Serum electrolytes are an acid base to formulate uh, therapy, um, fluid therapy. Calcium, phosphorus, and albumin. Again, very, very important. So whenever there's going to be a renal disease, there's going to be leakage of albumin in the uh, urine. So once there's going to be hypoalbuminemia, there's going to be a reduction in oncotic pressure. So you get ascites, you get uh, you know edema, all those problems. And in, uh, when the albumin is reduced, you are you need to be more careful about giving a fluid therapy because you will uh, cause uh, fluid overload uh, without uh, causing fluid resuscitation. So albumin is very very important evaluation of a CKD patient. So special examination you do um, uh, look for BP, um, then uh, radiography with contrast studies. Excellent. You so many uh, diagnosis. Ultrasound is again very important. Ultrasound, you know, you get uh, medullary rim sign in adrenal disease. Get um, subscapular fluid accumulation in case of, um, you know, uh, cat's uh, tumor, then PTSSA, renal biopsy. I tell you, uh, renal biopsy is also very good. Uh, renal biopsy is not meant for uh, CKD patients because you're not going to get much useful of that. Renal biopsy is for uh, young uh, animals. Uh, where they you think that there could be a reversible possible, then you can do a renal biopsy. So AKD versus CKD, we already know, but we'll let us see what are the characteristics of uh, chronic kidney disease and uh, you know uh, acute kidney disease. Uh, weight loss more than three months, CKD, reduced appetite more than three months, poor air flow, PUPD, polyuria, polydipsia for more than three months, uremic breath, for more than three months, small kidney signs, renal osteodystrophy, clinical signs, mild despite marked azotemia, hyperproliferative anemia. These are all characteristics of chronic uh, kidney disease. In a, acute kidney injury, there is a normal uh, body score, uh, recent reduction in appetite, healthy hair coat, recent change in urine volume, normal or large kidneys in case of uh, acute kidney injury. The reliability for differentiation, you get, uh, you know, the size of the kidney, then uh, renal osteodystrophy, then reduced appetite, then uh, clinical signs, uh, marked as acetemia, these are reliable signs for differentiating the AKD and CKDs. So you have IRIS International uh, uh, Renal Interest Society, which has given you staging based on plasma creatinine. So uh, less than 1.6 is stage one. Normal renal function this might be having uh, early renal disease. There is no uh, biochemical evidence for other than the uh, uh, mild uh, re reduction, increase in uh, serum creatinine. No acetemia, decreased GFR, no poor consolidating ability, all these things are not there, okay? Stage two, 33% uh, functioning, uh, renal functioning is there. Uh, in which there is a um, creatinine is uh, 1.6 to 2.8. There is mild acetemia. Uh, maladaptions can lead to uh, hyperparathyroidism and hypokalemia, uh, where you have a stage 2 uh, disease, early renal disease. Stage 3, only 25% of the uh, renal uh, nephrons are uh, still remaining, functioning, and uh, the creatinine value is 2.9 to 5 uh, grams per deciliter. Uremic uh, leads to uremic renal failure, moderate to severe azotemia, systemic signs present, example, bone pain, uremic uh, gastritis, anemia, metabolic acidosis, all these things will be present in stage 3 where the creatinine is up to 5 grams, 5 milligram per deciliter. And uh, when uh, only 10% of, uh, less than 10% of nephrons are remaining, you know, you classify them as stage 4 where there is more than 5 uh, milligram per deciliter of creatinine is an end-stage renal failure, increased risk of systemic clinical signs and uremic crisis. And you also, uh, the cases are then substage based on proteinuria and blood pressure. As I told you, most important thing in uh, chronic kidney disease is uh, creatinine, then uh, when uh, urine protein creatinine ratio and uh, hypertension, BP measurement. These three are the hallmark of uh, CKDs, and it is useful for staging them. So, 
0 to 0 0.2 is non proteinuric 0 0.2 to 0 0.1 is borderline proteinuric and 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 is proteinuric then um, risk of end organ damage for hypertension i told you when you have severe hypertension you have a possibility of as in, having a hypertensive retinopathy you have a possibility of uh, uh, you know affected uh, central nervous system all these problems are there so uh, 130 to 150 uh, milligram mercury pressure uh, hypertension uh, bp uh, min minimal risk 150 to 160 the low risk is there 160 to 180 moderate risk more than 180 uh, arterial uh, blood pressure very high risk then you have to protect them uh, with uh, drugs immediately so usually you can take a chance between 150 to 170 you can take a chance re-evaluating them weekly once to see if the uh, hypertension is increasing but on your initial presentation if there's going to be a renal arterial pressure of uh, 180 and above then you do not waste time and you can immediately start uh, treating them with the drugs which will uh, reduce the uh, anti-hypertensive drugs can be uh, done uh, seriously. So this is, uh, you know, um, a cutout you can always keep, uh, you know, uh, persistent proteinuria. Then you can do a urine protein, uh, you know, uh, urine creatinine uh, ratio. Uh, UPCR is more than two. Uh, you can start uh, treating them. UP, uh, UPCR is greater than uh, uh, one. You can investigate them for uh, uh, further uh, investigation. You can subject them. If uh, greater than 0 0.5 and greater than 0 0.4, then monitor them for serious one. So we have given you uh, Sven based on uh, urine protein, urine creatinine uh, ratio, how to go about uh, this one. This is a cutout which you can always keep. So RTG pressure stages for dogs and cats. This is again iris uh, staging for uh, dogs and cats based on uh, arterial blood pressure. Uh, stage uh, less than 150 mm mercury is uh, not having any issues. 150 to 159 stage 1, 160 to 179 stage 2, and more than 180 is stage 3. Of course, uh, diastolic blood pressure we are not using usually. Doppler uh, only uh, measures uh, systolic blood pressure. If you want a diastolic blood pressure, you, then you need to go to oscillometry meter. More expensive, but systolic blood pressure alone gives you a better picture of uh, hypertension. recommendation for CKD almost similar to dogs and cats not very great this one but you can definitely uh, equate them with uh, and see minimal differences while you are treating a different species okay stage one discontinue all nephrotoxic drugs which I have been using like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs we are using gentamicin or any drug which you think can be nephrotoxic uh, stop identify and treat pre-renal and post-renal abnormality Pre-renal or perfusion abnormality. Pre-renal, I told you, anything which reduces a blood to the uh, blood flow to the kidney, you can think as pre-renal. You have to identify them and treat them. Post-renal, there can be obstruction, there can be a ruptured bladder, there can be a tumor, uh, or there can be only simply a prostate. All those things can uh, lead on to obstruction and cause uh, when uh, hydronephrosis. All this thing can be a post-renal abnormality. Identify and treat them. Rule out pyelonephritis and urolith. I told you already, urine culture and urine examination and urine analysis and culture is important. Rule out pyelonephritis and urolith based on ultrasound and treatment. Measure uh, blood uh, pressure and uh, green protein creatinine ratios. Each one. Then manage uh, dehydration. Keep water. Bringer's lactate as an excellent um, uh, fluids for a fluid of choice for uh, as an hydration uh, fluid. And uh, keep water uh, easily said than done. It's very important, especially cats. 
you are required to keep water because they are already having, uh, you know, the stage one CKD. Their appetite is uh, lost completely, and therefore their drinking ability also is gone. And you might have to keep uh, different places, different types of vessels. Because uh, you know, cats are very uh, deceptive animals. You know, their their environment is very very important for them to, uh, you know, have a good uh, uh, a prognosis. And therefore, you should keep water in different places and different containers so that they might choose the one for them to. You know, cats have got, uh, you know, um, um, taste buds in the uh, tip of the tongue uh, for water alone. Very important that uh, water is kept in, good water is kept in different. Then systemic hypertension, less than 160 mm mercury, minimize extra renal damage, 160 to 179. It's hypertension for more than one to two weeks. You have to keep measuring them regularly. Each time when you measure the BP, you have to take five to six times and take an average and keep taking in different, different time of the day and different uh, days and average them and you come to a, you know, a value which you see is less than 160 or 160 to 179 and you know it's more than 180, it's clear hypertension. I told you already, if it's more than 180, you start immediately treating them. Don't have to wait for one to two. 160 to 179. You can keep measuring them regularly, two weeks gap, and see if it is increasing. So the treatment for uh, stage one: first, uh, reduce salt content of the food. Then uh, start using calcium channel blockers, amlodipine. Then angiotensin receptor blockers, elmisartan, almosartan. Both can be used. 2 milligram per kg SID. You can also use uh, enalapril. Then, uh, if uh, it's not showing much improvement, you can double the dose of amlodipine. Then, uh, uh, you know, if BP is still not uh, regulated, uh, then you can combine AC inhibitors and telmisartan. You can give enalapril and telmisartan or omlosartan. You can combine and uh, treat them. Then, monitor hypertension every three months. Once you know that it comes under uh, 170, then you can uh, st start treating them with the same type of drug, uh, antihypertensive drug, and uh, monitor hypertension every three months. Then proteinuria. Proteinuria again is a very very important, uh, you know, um, uh, diagnostic uh, thing for uh, renal day, uh, disease. So uh, we have seen the urine protein creatinine uh, ratio. If it is more than 0 0.4, investigate and treat for proteinuria. Borderline uh, urine protein creatinine 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. Monitor closely. Look for associated disease process. Consider kidney biopsy. If you are not having in your practice, you can always refer to a, a clinic where they do biopsy. Administer um, AC inhibitors and uh, start them on um, renal diet. Uh, then monitor response with uh, urine. Um, protein and creatinine ratio. Proteinuria and hypoalbuminemia, if it is coexisting, it's very, very important. I already told you there are so many diseases where there can be infarction and where there's going to be albuminemia. Start them on, uh, you know, aspirin or clopidogrel for thromboembolism. That is the reason why there's going to be acute renal failure or chronic renal failure. So you have to start them on uh, thromboembolytic drug. And check for hypercalcemia whenever you are giving a renal diet. They can go in for severe hypercalcemia because uh, suppresses uh, phosphorus. No phosphorus there, they can have calcemia. Do not give enalapril in a dehydrated cat. It can kill them. Ensure the cat is well hydrated before giving enalapril. Then stage two. Uh, all the practices can be like, similar to stage one. Manage dehydration with crystalloids. Treat uh, hypertension if it is less than 160 mm mercury. Hypertensive 160 to 179. Again, similarly, severe hypertension is more than 180. The target organ is affected. Start treating at once, I told you. There's going to be a renal hypertension. I mean, retinal hypertensive or retinopathy, start treating them. Again, uh, for systemic hypertension, uh, restrict the sodium chloride, amylodipine, enalapril, telmisartan, 
double the dose of amlodipine if poor response combine amlodipine and telmisartan or ac inhibitor and telmisartan on to the response and you will have to be very very careful if there is going to be because of your anti hypertensive therapy if it's going to become uh, less than 120 mm uh, mm uh, mercury the bp is going to become very less and the clinical signs are going to show weakness tachycardia then you know it's the hypotension you need to uh, reduce the dose or you, you need to discontinue some of the drugs uh, which we have been treating for hypertension. Protein area similar to stage 1. Then you have hyperphosphatemia in stage 2. Uh, renal diet where there is no phosphorus. Then you can go for phosphate binders. Of course, you have to monitor uh, phosphorus and calcium. We are using aluminium uh, uh, calcium binder, then you need to think about microcytosis and clinical signs of muscle weakness because they can always cause aluminum toxicity, which you have been very predominantly seen in human uh, phosphate binders. So, when you're using aluminum uh, phosphate binders, you'll have to see for muscle weakness and microcytosis. I would uh, avoid hypercalcemia, and if you find hypokalemic, then supplement potassium chloride. Stage 3, no clinical signs to extra renal signs. Treat as in stage 1 and 2. Treat dehydration, treat hypertension, treat proteinuria, treat hyperphosphatemia. And additional recommendations for stage 3. We have already staged based on uh, urine protein creatinine. We have staged them based on creatinine. We have based them on hypertension. Then you know what is stage 3. And uh, additional recommendation for stage 3. Uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, if, we, if it has metabolic acidosis, oral soda bicarbonate, okay? and vomiting, maropitant, condensetron for vomiting, decreased appetite, metacipine. See, metacipine is an uh, excellent uh, appetite stimulant, especially in cats. Uh, the, the small this one I have sent you here, it's a transdermal ointment, because, you know, the CKD uh, cat is going to, you know, be, uh, very problematic in making them eat in spite of using all uh, you know appetite stimulant and you know um, neurologies still very difficult and enteral nutrition is also going to be very difficult for a cat because any amount of handling a cat they're going to be stressed out once they are stressed out they're going to have a lot of steroids once they're going to be steroids they're going to be uh, 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 problems associated with steroids <coughs> so <coughs> this uh, novel uh, transdermal ointment, not available in our country, but still, if, nevertheless, if your client can get it from abroad, or if you can get it through Amazon, the wonderful ointment, the 5 gram tube costs, of course, very high. The 5 gram tube must be costing somewhere around 27 to 30 US dollars. But still, uh, you know, one inch of the ointment can be applied to the external pinna, inner part of the pinna. It has a wonderful uh, strength. There are a lot of uh, uh, research which has gone into this product. And uh, the uh, you know, uh, progression of the renal disease is uh, completely stopped by using this uh, metazapine uh, appetite stimulant drug. Stage 4, similar to other stages, additional recommendations, dorbipoietin. So, uh, you know, uh, erythrocyte stimulating hormone, uh, this can be uh, given weekly uh, once. Uh, the only thing is issue with uh, Darbo, uh, you can also give erythropoietin. There is no problem in giving erythropoietin also. But uh, erythropoietin, anti-erythropoietin antibodies are formed and the uh, uh, dog or cat becomes much more anemic than before. It doesn't respond to erythropoietin. And therefore, uh, Darbopoietin is uh, a better drug at the rate of 1.5 microgram per kg body weight subcutaneously over a week. Of course, you'll have to look for polycythemia. Uh, we are constantly monitor for polycythemia, uh, which is a common uh, problem as a grave concern, especially in cats. We <laughs> have to monitor uh, uh, blood, blood values. Polycythemia has increased PCV, increased RBC, increased WBC, all those things are on a very high level. That is polycythemia, or often called polycythemia vera. And most important, when you are giving darbopoietin, you have to give iron supplement uh, it is a must and you have to give at the rate of 500 to 300 milligram 
intramuscularly uh, you have to give iron uh, dextron still you have to give uh, dogs and cats okay uh, of course another most important thing which i have not mentioned here is calcitrol therapy uh, especially very very important in all stages you have to give calcitrol because of uh, you know um, hyperphosphatemia and absorption of calcium is interfered you have to give uh, calcitrol uh, and it slows the progression of renal disease stage from stage 1 to stage 4 they have to give calcitrol at the rate of 2 to 2.5 nanogram per kg once daily and when you're giving calcitrol it should be given in empty stomach that has to be uh, kept in mind of course uh, enteral nutrition is very very important in stage 4 you have to see that the animal is eating or you have to give enteral nutrition because they're not giving uh, uh, not the animal is not eating or not, not giving enteral nutrition there will be a mucosal turnover will be less in the uh, GI tract, which will lead on to catastrophic events, leading on to. I already told you, uh, you know, poor uh, fare and immunosuppression, gastritis, uh, MSs, hematemesis, melina. All those problems will come once there is no end. Of course, you can also consider dialysis. Uh, dialysis uh, uh, in veterinary practice is a better option. Uh, for uh, acute renal failure the uh, the acute renal failure in human patients how they uh, di diagnose acute renal failure in human patients usually they are admitted in hospitals for various problems and as a regular monitoring they find acute renal failure so for them dialysis they can start on earlier for us uh, the chances for the, our uh, clients to bring animals on uh, acute renal failure is very rare even if it is leptospirosis they are not going to come to us immediately they are going to come to us after a long time so uh, to see a uh, to see a dog in acute renal failure because of leptospirosis again a problem but other drugs other uh, diseases like you know like pyometra or uh, viper bite snake bite uh, or poisoning you know all these conditions or uh, you know the animal is suddenly brought uh, in shock hypovolemic shock because of accident so all these conditions you can definitely go in for dialysis it's an excellent option to revive them so only problem you have two types of i will talk about dialysis also so dialysis is excellent option when stage 4 so this is all again a cut out you can keep uh, the recommended dosage for different anti hypertensive uh, agents in dogs and cats you take a printout from your swen and keep it in your practice 